Good morning. I'm glad you all made it out this rainy Sunday morning. And uh, we are currently working on the newsletter uh, for next month, but you're going to see a lot of different announcements in it. Uh, we tried to come up with a schedule uh, that takes us through Advent and Lent. And I didn't want to have just another normal Bible study. And there weren't a lot that uh, attracted me. So we found uh, a devotional for Lent. Uh, and it's in a little book. We haven't done a devotional before. But uh, it's a way of uh, meditating and praying throughout the week. And there's a little reading for every day. And uh, the books will be free. And uh, we're still going to meet on, on Mondays. I know not everybody can come on a Monday, but uh, even if you can't, you can follow along on your own uh, with our devotional. And uh, for Lent, uh, rather than uh, giving things up, we're, I found a devotional uh, that will talk about giving thanks for 40 days of Lent. The other thing we wanted to do was uh, bring back some of our dinners, and I know everybody's missed them. So, uh, so we're going to have church decorating and then food the Sunday before Thanksgiving. Uh, Advent starts the Sunday after Thanksgiving. Uh, and we're, we're trying to uh, talk about at least one meal together uh, for every holiday season. Uh, but uh, we're going to have everything on a calendar so that you can just pop out that page and put it on a fridge and uh, so you'll always know what's going on. The, uh, just one uh, an other announcement, the title of the first hymn is not correct as it's printed in the bulletin. Uh, we're going to be singing glorious things of thee are spoken. But let's begin with our call to worship. It's inspired by Revelation 21, 1 through 6. And last week we started uh, a sermon on Revelations. And this week we're going to have our second one on Revelations. Join with me now. A church united across space and time. A church of many races, languages, and ethnicities. A church that lives by the work of God in Christ that was, is now, and is still to come. The one who is seated on the throne says to us, See, I am making all things new. A new heaven and a new earth, where the home of God is among God's people. God's future is epic, and it's good news. Remember God's future, for this is our story. Let us worship God whose promises Call and claim us. Join me now with uh, hymn number one, which, uh, which is uh, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. It's printed in a bowl.
Let us confess our sin to our God, who has made us, who knows us, and who loves us. Let us pray. Holy God, giver of all that is good, we recognize that you are the source of all that is. The breath of life is a gift from your generous hand. The food we eat is grown in the world you sustain. The community that supports us is called into being by your saving activity. Everything we have is a gift from you. So why do we treat life as though you are parsimonious with us? Why do we believe we must hoard our blessings? It is our sin that makes us live as though we don't trust your goodness. So forgive us, we pray. Teach us again what it is to rely upon you. Remind us that we are always in your loving care. Fill us with grace and goodwill, that our hearts might overflow from the fullness of your love. Amen. Let us each confess our sins silently. For we all, what God has made us, created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. Believe the promise of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Join me in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. of reading comes from Psalm 85, verses 4 through 13. Restore us again, God our Savior. Put away your displeasure towards us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger through all generations? Will you not receive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Show us your unfailing love, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will listen to what God the Lord says. He promises peace to his people, his faithful servants, but let them not turn to folly. Surely his salvation is near those who fear him, that his glory may dwell in our land. Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth, and righteousness looks down from heaven. The Lord will indeed give what is good, and our land will yield its harvest. Righteousness goes before him and prepares the way for his steps.
So I mentioned earlier that um, last week we were talking about the seven churches uh, from Revelation, that God sent John a vision to the seven churches in Asia, and uh, and he wrote uh, the book of Revelation. He the title in Greek is uh, Apocryphus, and um, and that really means to reveal, to lift a veil, so that we might see as we should see the world around us and our own actions. But one of the things when people read Revelations, uh, there's a lot of scary imagery and visions in that, but that's really not the purpose for Christians. And uh, I picked out a couple of my favorite verses. Last week, uh, we talked about Jesus standing on the door and knocking. And uh, Christians are to welcome him back into our hearts. Uh, and this week's verse comes from Revelation 21, 4. And uh, it speaks about what will happen uh, for Christians and what, what it will be like. Uh, when we are with God in God's kingdom. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I know that uh, even today it was raining quite a bit it, uh, over in Hempfield, Greensburg, it rained all night. I came out, flower pots were knocked over. And, uh, you know, um, sometimes I know when I wasn't, didn't have a church as a minister and I just attended church, it would be on days like this that I'd wonder, well, should I just go back to bed for another hour? It's warm under those covers. Uh, we just had the beginning of fall, our temperatures are changing and it's getting a little cooler out during the day and nights. This concept of uh, comfort, or last week uh, we read a verse about churches being lukewarm, but it's really about recapturing our zeal as Christians. I know that there's been times in my life when I may have felt anxious or worried, and I'd read the scripture or go to church, and I'd find comfort there. There were other times when things were happening in my life. Maybe I was younger and they started having sports on Sunday mornings, or maybe I was at college and didn't find a church right away that fit me. Uh, but there were times in my life, breaks, uh, when I go for a few weeks or a couple months without going to church. But then there were these times when I truly felt the presence of the Holy Spirit in my life. When I felt filled with what they call the zeal of Christian faith when I felt the presence of God with me, but more importantly, God was on my mind each and every day. So it kind of took two. I know God is always with us, but God was on my mind as well. And that reciprocal relationship helped me to experience that joy, that zeal that this book is really talking about. Some of the things in Revelation, and I told you before, it's not a book that I preach on very often. Uh, some of the things in this book seem frightening, but other things are hopeful. And for Christians, this book is really about finding hope again in Christ and inviting Christ into our lives. These were not only letters 
to seven churches in Asia, the very first churches in that region. But these churches were having some problems. And these were actually prophecies or oracles sent by God to John in a vision so that he could communicate what God thought the churches needed. Each of the seven churches had its own issues. Last week, we spoke specifically about one church that had become lukewarm. They were going through the motions. They were relying upon themselves rather than putting their faith and relying on Christ. They had lost their zeal. Remember, the focus of Revelation is not on all of the frightening visions, like uh, there's a vision of a dragon and the vision of fire, but the whole letter starts off with a vision of Christ as our Savior. And as we move through it, because the visions are so fantastic, our minds tend to be drawn to those frightening things. But the constant part of the vision throughout the book of Revelation is the presence of Christ in each of the visions. The focus is on the Messiah's return and the coming of God's kingdom to earth. And that is what God wants for everybody in those seven churches and for us today. For it is the promise of the Messiah that should change our outlook and the outlook of the church. And that focus should renew our faith and zeal. Are they focused on worldly concerns or do they look to the promises of Jesus Christ to be fulfilled. Those seven churches were worried quite a bit about earthly things. God wanted their focus to change. This should be our focus as well, but even though I'm not one to interpret visions and prophecies of the Lord for you, for we don't understand all that was written, I don't want to ignore them either or wash over them lightly. There are some that are quite obvious when we place them in the context of what God is saying to those seven churches. John wrote, I turned to see who was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven oil lamps burning on the top of seven golden stands. In the middle of the lampstands, I saw someone who looked like the Son of Man. This is obviously representing those seven churches, one candle for each of the churches that God was speaking to. So Christ was in the midst of these seven candles, and the number seven appears throughout Revelation. But Christ looked so glorious to John at that point, so glorious that John fell to the ground and put his face to the earth. Jesus reached out his hand and placed it upon John and said, Do not be afraid, for it is I. So there's also a burning sword in this. And if you recall, most angels, whenever they are described with a weapon, it's also a burning sword. And there's a call to change. And that's the purpose of these letters. A call that these churches might commit themselves to Christ again, but wholly, not just going through the motions but with vigor and enthusiasm, filled with joy and zeal. See, I stand at the door knocking. That was our scripture from last week. Christ is in their very midst in the vision 
but also in reality. Will they open the door and welcome him again? Or will they be cut off from that relationship by their own choice? His presence in their midst shows the immediacy of Christ in our lives. My friend, David De Silva, and I was just speaking to him, he uh, is an expert on Revelations, and he wrote this book on Revelations, and, uh, and I, I've been asking him some questions all week. And he writes, John and God's vision would call us to do the same. So God is speaking not only to the seven churches, but just as the whole Bible tells us the history of God's path with humans and believers, we can learn as well. And this book can speak to us, but maybe not as we thought. Maybe the visions spoke to some things that were happening to those seven churches. But those seven churches were experiencing the same thing, the same struggles that churches experience today. It transcends time because we're just humans. To seek the same, he calls us, to seek the same apocalyptic or revelatory adjustment in our own vision, in our own view of the world that he sought and gave to his congregations. Revelation still interprets and calls us to interpret the social, political, religious, economic revelations of our everyday lives. It does this not by asking us to equate the images with those realities, or by attempting to line up maybe the seven seals with the broadcasts on CNN. Rather, Revelation invites Christ's followers, each of us, into the same process that guided John when he wrote this. John came upon his own Revelation, calling these congregations to greater levels of a covenant relationship with God, to recapture the faith and that Christian zeal which once brought them and us to the church in the very beginning. David continues by saying, John's example challenges us today to dare to see things as they really are. That's why it's called Revelation, to reveal what God wants us to truly see, as God would have us see these things and all that is around us. That is to see more uh, of uh, ourself in systems that are working in the world today. John challenges us to look at the costs in human terms of perpetuity, those of perpetuating those systems, and to look beyond the public discourse that tends to hide that which makes us uncomfortable with our ongoing participation alongside those systems. John challenges us positively also to dare to see things as they could be, were God truly worshiped, if God's commandments were truly followed to love one another. What if we lived these out in our lives and the testimony that Jesus embodied in the good news of the gospel. Remember, a revelation is like lifting a veil so that we might truly see what is before our very eyes. But it had been obscured or misunderstood or we weren't focused on it. 
We weren't focused on the important things. But if we simply ask ourselves, what would Jesus have us see? What would Jesus have us do? All will be made clear. It's like bringing Jesus to our minds. <coughs> when we think about Christ, when we think about the Holy Spirit in our lives, it changes the way we see everyone we interact with, every problem that we experience, everything that we go through throughout the day is changed or revealed in the light of Jesus Christ. Revelation also tells us to set our faith and our hope in Jesus, not in ourselves or in our jobs or in our hobbies, but in Christ. So there's a pattern to the way John writes Revelation, a pattern to the way these things are revealed to John in this book. And we can ask the same questions to ourselves today as John and God asked to those seven churches so long ago. And here's the questions we can think about. What do we need to bear in mind most about Jesus in order to respond to him and to our own situations in faith? When we think about this, it could be there's no one answer. It's unique for each and every one of us. What I bear in mind is I simply say, you know, it's like that old wristband kids would wear WWJD, what would Jesus do? And just bringing Jesus to my mind in a situation changes, not only the way I see the situation, but it's all made more clear what I should do in that situation. The next question, what are we doing that bears witness to the Gospels and to Jesus Christ already or perhaps, what do we need to do as individuals and as a congregation? What are we doing or failing to do such that this witness might be stifled or muted, maybe not seen in its full zeal as it should? Where is that zeal? Where is our passion? our full response to Christ through the Holy Spirit. And what promises from God do we need to keep in our hearts to sustain us and help us in this process of transformation and drawing us back to true faith? When people are filled with the Spirit, they're excited. They're excited to be filled, so excited that this love and generosity and Christian actions not only flow through us with the Holy Spirit, but they overflow these human vessels as a cup overfloweth. And we extend that love and faith and the story of the Gospels to all who might hear. Revelation calls us to stand as Christians for whatever is the truth, to remove the veils from our eyes, and to see through the eyes of Christ, ultimately with love and faith. We're called to invest ourselves again in Christ, to open the door to our hearts, to invent the Holy Spirit in, so that filled with the Holy Spirit, we might experience that Christian zeal anew. We have to remember that these letters are about the triumph of good over evil. They are not written to cause us worry or strife. We are to focus on the positive things that it says. 
for we will be part of God's kingdom. So let's look again at our verse from today's scripture, and it speaks to us of God's promise in Revelation. And this is the verse I like in Revelation because this is where we are to place our hope in God's vision. This is what God will provide for us. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or cry or pain for the old order of things has passed away and there will be a new order with God's kingdom and each of us, we will be together again. Amen. And now we're going to sing our hymn, Be Still My Soul.
any updates that you might have about friends or family and how they're going. And we'll pray together and ask for God's intervention and give God thanks for his blessings. And uh, I do want to share that um, I talked with um, Sandy, and um, she is in the hospital, um, but she's under, she has an infection in her foot, and uh, she's on antibiotics, and hopefully she'll be out soon. And she's just praying that they'll find a permanent remedy Lord God, we come to you in prayer and we first give you thanks for all of your blessings, the blessings that are obvious and the blessings that occur each and every day of our lives that we may not even observe or pay attention to, but we know that you are with us. Lord, we give you thanks for all that will happen, for we know you know what is best in our lives. You also know our needs, and we lift them up to you in prayer this morning. Lord God, we, we give thanks. We give thanks for healing, and uh, we give thanks for all of the blessings in our lives. And yet we have many needs, and we know that you can intervene on our behalf, for you are all powerful. Lord, we ask for your healing, your physical healing, for all those who are suffering, who are ill or injured. Be with the doctors, the nurses, and uh, just heal them. We know that all is possible. We ask for continued recovery and recuperation for those who are home uh, and recovering. Lord, we we ask that you be with each parent and child who are going through stressful times, that you return them safely to their homes, that all might be well. Lord, we pray that 
You be with all of those who are struggling in any way, whether they need uh, financial assistance or food, shelter, home, clothing, those who have experienced natural disasters or automobile wrecks or any, any obstacle or struggle. We ask for your presence. Lord, we pray for all of those who are experiencing emotional stress, anxiety, worry, depression, whatever it might be. Give them the peace that can only be found through the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that you be with those who are struggling with addiction. Help them to find recovery. Be with all who are searching spiritually so that they might find Jesus Christ. Work through us so that we might touch others in your name. Lord, we ask for peace throughout the earth and for your presence to be known. And we pray the way you taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Join me in our closing hymn, When We All Get to Heaven. coffee hour and fellowship following the service. Um, 
and uh, we'll have a time to uh, to see each other and, and catch up with one another. Everybody's welcome. And uh, as you leave the church today, know that God wants us to experience the zeal of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And now may the Lord God bless you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.